Hello. John. Yes. Hey, it's Rustin Rose with Metalholic Magazine and Metal Nation Radio. How are you doing? I'm doing good, man. What's happening, brother? Not much. Just uh, felt like it seemed like time to talk about a new album, and you just happened to have one. <laughs> I do, man. I'm ready to get that thing out, too. Feels like we've been done with it and sitting here waiting to get it to come out here, man, but we're getting close now. Yeah, March 17th, the date of the new release, so yeah. congrats on the 10th studio album, self-titled. You sort of teased us last year with two studio tracks on the live album. Yeah, we had a couple of songs that have been kind of lingering around here, kind of leftovers from the Ink album and uh, stuff, so we were kind of debating what to do with them, and then we did that U.S. tour, and we wound up with this live footage that we just kind of loved so much. We thought it'd be fun maybe to put some live things on there, put a couple new songs to kind of tease a little bit for the new record, and put a little uh, some release out to bridge the, the difference between the two records. So, uh, But it was, it was pretty fun there, and a couple of cool songs to, to play with and something to hold you over before the new record comes out. Absolutely, and the new record is coming out, as we said, on March 17th. Fantastic record. Over three decades and ten albums into your career, you self-titled the new one. Is there some significance there? Not really. <laughs> you know, we're certainly a band that does not overthink and uh, over, uh, you know, talk things too much. But, you know, you know, looking back and thinking about it, because people ask, you know, so just in hindsight and thinking about what kind of happened and why we did that, uh, it was just more or less just a couple of combinations of reasons. Number one is we kind of we love the artwork. You know, it's a it's an it's an older logo take on an older logo that Andreas did, but in that pewter form and that metal form with the faces in it and stuff. And we just love the look of that logo on a black album by itself. So we just you know we just, because we kind of fell in love with just that plain and simple look. Uh, that was kind of one reason why we're all just kind of looking at it, going, man, it just looks nice the way it is, you know. But uh, you know. I, I, a lot of bands, you know, sooner or later, you're allowed to just take a mulligan, I guess, and not have to worry about trying to come up with a title for an album. So we just thought we'd pull a mulligan there and then just get away without having a, a title at all. So I think it works perfectly. I mean, ten tenth album sort of seems to make sense. So and not so yeah, tenth album is another thing. I didn't really realize that until I started doing some of these interviews and people were like, "Hey, this is your tenth album." I'm like, "Really? Gee, I didn't even it didn't dawn on me at the time." So. But yeah, it just it just feels fitting, you know, for whatever reason. Now that's all said and done and out there and stuff. It, uh, you know, the the last album was a little extreme for us, you know, even for as heavy as we are and whatever. That album was a little bit graphic and more extreme, uh, with the ink and blood and the whole title. So this thing is a step back a little bit, back into a more obituary type style, a classic death metal album cover, and uh, it just feels good. Not surprisingly, the new album is fast, angry, and aggressive, but it's also got a surprisingly good amount of melody and groove. Tell us about the album from your perspective. Yeah, you know, I mean, I think that's always a good thing to have. You know, it's that mix. You know, I think it's it, what what makes obituary obituary, at least to me, is 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 we do fast stuff, we do slow stuff, but it's that middle mid tempo groovy stuff that really is what defines and makes obituary obituary. It also just seems like you know sometimes the older you get, or maybe or whatever, but sometimes we find that the just the more simple a rhythm comes out and the more basic it can be. The, the heavier it winds up sounding, you know, a song like Low, for instance, which is just a ridiculous rhythm by itself, uh, and not, not too many bands would get away with playing something as silly as that, but man, when that thing kicks in, it's just the heaviest thing they ever heard in to man. So a lot of times we're just kind of cavemen, and we like the simple approach to things, and, you know, you need the fast rhythms, you need the slow rhythms, but that meaty stuff is really what we live to try and to come across when we're out here messing around and writing. Right. And, of course, this is the second album with Terry and Ken in the band. How did that impact yep. writing and recording the new record? It, uh, yeah, you know, this is like, this is the second record. So the first one, neither one of them did much, you know, uh, writing or anything like that. You know, obviously, Kenny did the leads for it. Right. Um, and, but this, this time around, Kenny actually wrote two of the songs. So that was kind of fun. I mean, Donald and I, have, you know, uh, haven't done that much recording with other bands. It's almost almost everything that we've done in our career has been with, you know, with Trevor, you know, and or guitarist for Obituary. So we haven't done a lot of writing, and Kenny hasn't done a lot of writing. He's a relative rookie uh, in, in, in being in a band and writing songs, too. So, you know, it was kind of fun and, and interesting for everybody when he came over and just had a couple of ideas. It's kind of what makes this kind of fun is when you create these things, because if you think about it, you get, you know, he comes up, he just has a couple of rhythms that he's thinking about. And you're listening to them, you know, whether it's re recorded or whatever, and it's just, you know, a plain kind of sounding, and it's just a rhythm by itself, and doesn't know what to do with it. He just played for this and for that and for this kind of thing, and there's no song or any rhyme or reason to anything. And he's just looking at me, and I'm, you know, I'm just like, 
what do you want me to do with that kind of thing, you know? But uh, so Donald and I start picking at it and dissecting it, and we like to to, to mess around with them and, and and you know and make a song out of it. And it's just it's kind of fun, you know. You sit and mold it and take your time with it, and when you come across cool things that you can say and how a song gets going, it's it's really what's neat to breathe life into those simple rhythms when you get them and and, and form them into a song that you can go in any direction that you want. You know, I I, I couldn't be happier with our lineup right now. I mean, just the five of us. Uh, we get along so well. Uh, we're all on the same page. We're we're absolutely playing really good live right now. We sound, you know, we're really tight and right where we need to be. All cylinders are firing, and uh, you know, couldn't be happier with our lineup. We're just ready to get out and hit that Creator tour for sure. Yeah, that's going to be a truly sick tour. Creator with horrendous and midnight. I'm looking forward to seeing that if you make it to my neck of the woods. Nice. So I mentioned Melody and Groove before. Um, two of my favorite tracks on the record are Sentence Day, uh, which has quite a bit of melody under the brutality, and Lessons, uh, Lesson yeah. in Vengeance, which has quite a bit of groove and swing to it. Tell us about those tracks, if you would. Uh, well, Sentence Day is funny because we're sitting there, and then Donald and I usually get left alone. You know, the studio's here at my house. He's over here almost every day. Right. Uh, you know, the other guys come and go a, a lot, but he's here almost every day. But so we get we get a lot left in our lap where we're like, okay, well, how are we going to piece this thing together, and what are we going to do? And uh, so after we kind of had that song together, it just it lined up to have so much soloing going on. That Kenny's just like, I just he goes, I can't keep playing solo that whole time. <laughs> and we're like, dude, just go back, listen to Kill 'Em All, and just start ripping off Kurt Hammond's leaves, dude. You got to go for it. <laughs> and and you tell Kenny that, and he'll take you to heart. And you can see there's just a lot of great leads in that thing, just you know, very Metallica like, you know, on purpose, but uh, it, you know, to a fault. But I, you know, I just think it's a lot of fun. It's a great song. It has a, a lot to it. Uh, the little video that went along with it, I thought captured it pretty good, and uh, you know that that was a fun song, you know, especially for for Kenny to get to do so much leads on those things. Uh, a lesson in vengeance. I'm sitting there humming it to my head real fast to kind of get the the, the feel for it. Uh, it's just, I mean, this classic kind of sounding obituary song. I'm not really sure what to say in particular about it, but just a heavy, fun song to listen to. Like so many of them on that record, it just seems like you go through them song per song, and every one of them just sounds a little bit different. I mean, some of those songs we wrote like. Oh, you know, going on almost two years, a year and a half ago, right. and then we kind of got pulled away from writing. And we got on the road and did some touring here and there, and then came back home and dove back into writing again and wrote some other songs. And I think that break in between was nice because it gave it a little bit different breakup of songs, you know, from even if it be a year and a half difference when you wrote them, but it gives you time to, to you know get other uh, influences or whatever and come up with different things. So I think a lot of songs sound different from each other, which is which is a good thing too. So. How long does it usually take after you've recorded and released an album before you can look back at it objectively? You know, you really, you know, we really look back at it pretty soon after it kind of gets mixed and we're done with it. Uh, and you know, you you go through, you know, and you do, you listen to the, a whole hell of a lot. If if I think about the times from when I first were sitting in a room and kind of coming up with ideas to the uh, thousands of time later that we sat and listened to it and tried to arrange it and practice it and do it, and then you record it, and then you mix it. I mean, you listen to that thing a lot. So by the time it's kind of done and handed off, and you're like, you, once you give it its final blessing, you're like, all right, everybody happy, it's done. Uh, you go back, and then that, that's when I get into it the most. Um, I listen to it the most and enjoy it the most. And then, you know, when you go back, and especially if I look at some of our older albums, and I go back and put Cause of Death on, and I sit and I listen to that thing, I'm just like... Ah, uh, you know, and it's kind of painful in a way. You know, it's kind of almost like those pictures that your mom has of you on hanging up on her wall, and you got to walk in with your friends, and they see it, and they're old pictures of you, and you just, you know, you got stupid hair to cut, and your mom had a silly shirt on you, or whatever it is, and you just feel that way. So uh, it's interesting to us when you go back and listen to your music of how much stuff you wish you could redo. You know, things you think you could sing better now, things you wish you, you know, like Donald's all the time. So I think of that snare drum or what happened there. You know. So you're always critical on yourself down the road, and you're probably almost certain to be never be always kind of happy with it. I think this is really one of our you know best produced records that we've done to date. I think it, I think the sound of it came out great. So you know I, I hope in ten years from now I still think the same thing. But like I said, there's there's always something that you go back and can be critical about on your albums. You know, but that's just the nature. Probably you know most people are like that. And I know you said you guys usually, you know, music is the most important. You come up with the song titles last. What were some of the working titles you guys used as placeholders? <laughs> oh, God. Hold on. Let me see if I got my notebook sitting here. This could be funny. 
they always get silly. I mean, we go from everything from just because it's the first song you start working on, it gets called song one, uh, to, you know, to any silly thing that you kind of come up with, you know, whatever it might be, you know, Donald steps in a pile of dog shit on his way into the studio, and next thing you know, you start writing on it, and, you know, you'll call that thing, you know, dog shit or something like that. <laughs> and, uh, and we're usually the worst with titles. I guess that falls a lot on me. Uh, sometimes I'm like, well, why is it my job to come up with all these song titles? But, you know, we do we do start off with an awful lot of working titles. And then, uh, you know, as we go and I start singing lyrics and I kind of just start looking for stuff. Yeah, I'm sitting here looking through my book here. Let's see if we can find anything funny. Yeah, a lot of these this time turned out to be song titles. Sometimes there's songs we told one of them 175 because that just was the tempo of the thing that we decided to do. <laughs> song 10. It turned to stone, got a name early. I don't know. I don't really see anything that funny this particular time. Old 49er. I have no idea why. Oh, it was song. We we wrote a song, and we were on song four, and then uh, we didn't finish it. We got a halfway through or something, and then just set it on the back burner for a while. And then we were writing a song nine later on in the recording, and the uh, Trevor was sitting there. It's like, man, that rhythm would really go good with that one. So we mixed song four and nine that they were at the time, and we called it Old 49er. <laughs> and put the song together that way. So as you can see, we 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 really hold ourselves to know. We had one called Hellhammer, uh, just because that's uh, it was a you know very Hellhammer type song. I think we had one Sabotage also that we uh, we had a Frost and a Sabotage that we uh, <laughs> in there uh, as far as working titles go. So it's kind of whatever kind of comes to your mind. But we also don't hold ourselves to any rules whatsoever when it comes to writing. We just do kind of whatever we want to do. And uh, and just if we're having fun with it, we let it ride. Nice. So now you guys also recorded a blistering new song called "No" that was released solely through Decibel Magazine as a flexi single. It's not on the yeah. record. Yeah. Will that surface on an extended edition, or are fans kind of screwed if they didn't get a copy of that? <laughs> you know, that was one of those things where it was a little bit hard for us to to say uh, yes to no on that on that uh, release. But, you know, Decibel does their little flexor release. They want a song, and if you want to do it, you kind of got to give it to them and let them go. So, you know, they, in fairness, they want that for their kind of use, you know, for the, at least the first six months or whatever it might be. But, uh, you know, eventually we'll put it out there in some form or fashion on something else. So if somebody's got a collection going, they can get the, get the whole thing there. Um, but, you know, Decibel's doing the tour. They really they did, they give us a great write-up on the album. They're really down with the new record and, and, and working good with us on setting up this tour. And uh, we just felt that they're giving us a lot of good coverage and stuff. So we, we felt that the right thing to do to go ahead and let them use one of those songs, you know, use that song. Uh, and that's actually one of Ken's songs. So one of one of Ken's did make it on the record, and that's another one of them. He wrote two for that uh, that we had to play with, and we used that one uh, as that. And it's, it's kind of a fun song, a little bit different from what we would do, a little thrashier from what we would do. But, you know, we, we're not afraid to try something a little bit different and that thing. We just know as long as we keep things heavy and, and, and do it in obituary style that we, we should be okay with it. We were talking a minute ago about looking back on albums and perspective and everything. This year marks the 25th anniversary of the third album, The End Complete. Can you share your memories of making that one? The End Complete. Jeez, that's a lot of brain cells. <laughs> uh, I believe that's still Scott Burns and still more sound. Uh, product there that we did with that record um, I think The Incomplete was one of our best selling records believe it or not um, at the time, it was a great album cover uh, we did a video for that thing it was all early on, you know, we figured when we did slowly, you know, we had so many of those songs kind of written and didn't really plan on doing an album, so when Roadrunner kind of came to us that we had wanted to do an album, we just kind of gave them some music and did and thing and it was kind of out there before we knew it, didn't really pay much attention to it and then, you know, they kind of got the idea to do the second record, which we kind of wrote fast, really, and got Cause of Death out, because we had a bunch of songs for that, too. It was just a matter of finishing up a handful of other songs, and we got that out. So it seems like those first two albums were a little bit of a blur. Never did any touring for Slowly to Rock, and I think, you know, some of us weren't even out of high school yet. So even though we did get out and we did some touring for Cause of Death, it really wasn't until the end complete came around that I think we kind of really all started looking at each other and, and, and seeing what was in front of us, you know, for what what we could possibly do. So it was actually a pretty important record for us and one we had time to think about, plan for, and, and put together as a whole, where the first two just kind of flew by really fast without even much paying attention to them. So. All right, so before we get out of here, we're trying to educate some people on death metal. 
because Obituary is among the most recognized and respected death metal bands of all time. In your mind, what makes a great death metal song or album? I think what makes, and it wouldn't really, you know, I, I think it's just one of those things that stands for all music, to be honest with you, across the board, and that's originality. You know, something that just is unique and different. You know, it's not something you can do. You can't go find the five best musicians in the world and put them in a room and think they're going to write the best song. It doesn't happen. It very well could be just about the five worst musicians that just happen to come up with something cool, catchy, and awesome that makes a thing. So, you know, I think that's just obituary's recipe and, and what, what the best be is it's just a, a very original sounding song. So if we pull out the canon of obituary work, what are two or three of Death Metal's most essential albums in your mind for the uninitiated? I am an old fashioned caveman, especially when it comes to my death metal. So I when I start listening to it, I go dig way back into the vaults of the stuff that I kinda or you know, first really turned me on in, into wanting to, to, to do stuff as heavy as we did. And that's something like Venom's black metal and, you know, the a Hellhammer record or maybe even that first Morbid Tales record are just two things that really, you know, I know early in our career, when we were just still riding around on bicycles in the neighborhood, you know, living at home and stuff, we would ride around and, you know, the guys from Sabotage were starting their stuff and Nasty Savage was starting their stuff. And those are the first two bands as little kids before we even really, you know, before we were ever a band. That's really what got us interested in being a band. But it was that early Venom, that early Celtic Frost stuff that really opened our eyes and, to, to, and focused us on what we wanted to do, which was, you know, really just try to make right things as heavy as we possibly can. And that's really what sticks with us today. You know, we, we like to do a lot of things in this and that, but we just like to make everything as heavy as we possibly can. Awesome, John. Again, thanks so much for taking the time. Congratulations on the new album and have a fantastic Nice, forest. brother. Nice. Well, I certainly appreciate all the support and uh, time that you guys give us. And if you got some time, if we're in your area, come out and see us and throw something at me and come over and have a beer or something. We'll, uh, we'll hang out and talk. Sounds good. Take care, my friend. Cool. Thank you, brother.